So you are my people. You're my people. I'm a southern boy. We, uh, we would say, you, you bought a pig and a poke. You, you don't know what this talk is. And here you are. So it's going to be good. I'm going to like this. Kids today. OK, so I'm an iOS developer. So occasionally in this talk, it's going to be a little bit, you're going to be like, I'm not, an, I don't understand. That's an iOS joke. But you know, stay with me. It's OK. I've tried to translate. The iOS conference world is a lot smaller. And it's actually quite kind of tight knit compared to Android and server and all, all these other worlds. They're very big. The iOS world is actually quite small, believe it or not. Um, and there's this family who's actually quite famous. They're called the, the Klein family. And they have for years run small conferences um, all around the country. And um, they're called CocoConf, which is sadly no more. But they, but they did run it for many years. And in 2017, the Klein family invited me to speak at this conference in Yosemite. Yes, Yosemite. <laughs> ah, OK, OK. Um, they might not have invited me. I may have begged a little bit. But they did say yes, and that's exactly the same thing. So um, I, incredible, amazing conference, right? This, was, this is just the best place. I mean, this conference has been great, but I mean, we had photo walks. I really wanted to be there. It was great, but it also is a weird conference. It's like a conference made up of nothing but keynotes, like two days of just keynote talk after keynote talk, right? And I've never done a keynote-y talk before. And, and they're different. They, they actually work a different way. And I didn't know how to do it. I usually give technical talks, right? I talk about steganography or Swift generics or you know what's a functor. I, I, these are the things I kind of do. And I'm very comfortable with those things. But keynotes, the point of a keynote is to give you bigger ideas, right? They're supposed to be how to write software, like in the whole, or how to live and you know think and learn. And, uh, and I don't know if I'm the best person for it. I mean, to give advice. Now, it's not that my life hasn't turned out well. It really, really has. It, it's just that I kind of play life on the easiest settings you could. right? I got pretty much every starting advantage you can get. And I luck into things all the time that people are like, help. Oh, how do you get that? It just happens. And I get away with things <laughs> that most people would not get away with. right? So I'm not always certain that my advice is all that helpful to people outside of you know, Xcode and iOS development. There you should always listen to me. I'm always right. But you know, I don't know. I didn't know. So I went to my friend. This is Jamie Newberry. And she is a, she's a pretty well-known speaker, again, over in the iOS world and in design, in the design world where she did a lot of work. And I love her talks. And uh, I wanted to learn how to do what she does. And uh, I tell her, I go, I've never done this before. I don't know how to do it. I don't know if I have a lot to offer. And she has some you know, helpful thoughts on the subject. She says, everybody has their story, right? And it's their story. And it's a valid story. Right? And so you know, it's my story. It's your story. It may not apply to everyone, but maybe it applies to somebody. And so if you want to do it, go for it. And, and I did. That's me, you saw me. And it actually went really well. This is the fifth time I've given this talk. And every time I give this talk, it changes. So this is different than every other time I've ever given it. Um, it's kind of had to change, because I've changed over all that time. The, my first time was 2017. And every time this talk actually gets a little bit more meta, you'll see what I mean. Kids these days, I mean, kids these days, uh, every JavaScript kitty, they just come over into iOS land, and they think everything's going to be automatically fixed for them. right? And one little retain loop, or heaven forbid, a strong type, and you cannot be a real developer if you do not learn how memory is managed by the computer. We all know that. I mean, when I started programming, you really, really had to know what you were doing. I think I had, like, had to hand wire all my own RAM. OK, that is not quite as complicated as I remember it being when I got started. Um, 
I don't know where the memory management is in there, but that actually is my first program. I, I, I remember it to this day. My grandmother was a typing teacher. And once when she was visiting, uh, when I was eight years old, she brought this computer. It was an Apple II Plus. Right? And it belonged to the school, and it came with a big blue three-ring binder filled with uh, programming lessons. And uh, while she was visiting, uh, she said I could try it out. And uh, so we turned it on, beep, brrr, and up came, comes this blinking cursor. And I turn to page one, and I start typing, and I fall in love. In fact, I felt, I felt so much in love that my grandmother saw a great opportunity. I told you she was a typing teacher, and um, she started teaching me how to type when I was five. Now, we didn't actually own a typewriter, so she took a nickel and a file folder, and she drew out all these circles, and she sit me down five years old and trying to teach me how to type. You'll notice there's not even letters on it. Right? That's how she did it. And um, this worked about as well as you might imagine, which is to say it did not work at all. I, I was eight years old, I had no idea how to type. But uh, that computer, I love that computer so much. She's told me I could not play with it unless I used the right fingers to type. And so I watched my hands very, very closely, and I typed very, very slowly. And um, by the end of the week, I was probably typing, I guess, 10 words a minute. But my typing kept speeding up really fast over the next few years because for the next few years, I, I just kept typing things. I kept typing things out of these magazines. If anybody remembers, this was Nibble magazine and the Beagle Brothers. And you would type in these crazy, crazy programs. It would make like the cursor spin or something. It'd be crazy. But it was, I would just start messing around. I typed them in and then I would just poke and play and like see if I could make something a different color. Or um, I tried to make an adventure game and it was made entirely out of dozens and dozens of if-then statements. Nothing but if-then statements for this whole game. I was just playing around, right? Everything was a global variable. Everything was mutable state. I did learn go sub, if you know that from basic, right? And so I did have subroutines, actually lots and lots and lots of subroutines. and. Um, Every other design piece was horrible. It was, um, it was really the software equivalent of playing in mud. And I loved it. And then, the Apple IIe. You can't see it here. This down here is the caps lock key because the Apple IIe has lowercase. Ooh. Had an 80 column card rather than four. You could buy an extra card so instead of 40 characters, you had 80 characters wide on the screen. It's fantastic. I programmed on this almost every day for years. Maybe I should say, you know, programmed, I guess. I, I don't know. I was mostly just copying stuff, right? Out of books and magazines and, you know, tweaking stuff and, you know, playing. So I'm guessing at this point, some of you in the room are like, oh, good grief, Rob, you're so ancient. And some of you are like, Rob, you're a kid. When I started, we had a stack of punch cards and we took it to the window and then the operator the next day told us we had a syntax error. And, you know, you're both right. I told you about my grandmother. This is my grandmother, that's my dad, my grandfather. And my grandparents lived in a trailer park for years and years and years. And they were actually part of the very first group to buy plots in this park. And um, it was really, an, it was a community. And they had their own post office. My grandmother volunteered there. She sorted mail. And other folks, you know, they volunteered to mow the common areas or to repair things or whatever. It was a community. But one day, she's sitting with me, and she says, she's telling me about all these lazy kids who are moving into um, the trailer park. And they didn't want to work. All they wanted to do was hire somebody to you know, mow the grass. Because all these kids wanted to do was sit around and enjoy their retirement. Oh, they think they're old, 65. They don't know anything about being old. Wait till they're 80. So now she's 98. <laughs> and she lives in this kind of uh, retirement uh, uh, apartment. And uh, now she laughs about the 80-year-olds 
because they're all running around with their activities. <laughs> they don't know what it means to be old either. And that is when I realized that maybe you could become a newbie at any time in your life. But still, 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 kids these days. I mean, a few years after I learned basic, um, I took up assembly language, 6502, assembly language on the Apple, and I started with shape tables, if anybody used them. It's like vector graphics that you lay out nibble by nibble. And it's not assembly language, but you do all this peeking and poking to make it work, and that got me really interested in low-level programming. And so I saved up all my birthday money and all my, all my, all my, all, anything I could get, my allowance, and I went and bought the Merlin assembler, right? And I started writing stuff. But you know, kids today, one unsafe mutable buffer pointer and poof, you know, they're totally lost. But I was sixth grade, right? I was doing assembly language. So clearly something is wrong with these kids. So what does, when I say I knew, six, I, I programmed in 6502, what did that mean? What was assembly language in 1983? Well, the 6502 has 56 instructions. But really, there's only about a couple of dozen of the, all of these instructions that are different, right? Almost all of them are just parallel, right? There's something that will load. There's an accumulator. There's an X register. And there's a Y register. And that's actually it. And so there's a load accumulator operator. Op operator and then there's a load X operator and a load Y operator. It's, it's very, very consistent, very regular. Um, and it's actually much more straightforward than you'd imagine. In fact, when you have these building blocks, 6502 assembly is really just this. This is a game. It's called uh, Human Resource Machine. I love this game. It's a puzzle game, right? But really, when you get done with it, it really, really boils down to keeping track of what's in what memory location. Frankly, it's more tedious than difficult, right? Now, I am not saying at all that writing a complex program in assembly language is simple. It is not, right? I'm just saying that it's not that hard to get started with simple programs, right? And that's all I was doing. I was sixth grade. I mean, I, I was building things that said, that printed my name to the screen. Come on. There just aren't that many pieces to learn. Memory is flat. There are no threads. You hardly, there's hardly even an operating system, right? The old Apple II Plus operating system doesn't do anything, right? It's basically just you and the processor, right? You can see everything, and there's hardly any mysteries. Now, I want to compare that to iOS development. And I really like this book. It's, uh, it's called Apple's App Development with Swift. And I think it's a very nice introduction for beginners. It's, it's supposed to take you from, like, I've never programmed to building iOS apps. But there is so much to learn before you even, get, you know, to build an app. OK, so what did I start with? On an Apple IIe, you flip the CPU switch, you flip the monitor switch, beep, whirr, you hit the reset button, and up comes a prompt. You don't even need an editor. You just type, start typing basic. That's it. You go. It's built into the, it's built in, right? Now, how you get started with iOS? First, you download Xcode. Oh my God. It's enormous. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's actually just intimidating the size of it. Just unpacking it takes minutes, right? I mean, it is, it is a huge thing and it's a very complicated thing, right? And then you kind of get your hands around Xcode and then you've got storyboards and cues and segues and throws and closures and frameworks and frameworks and more frameworks, and code signing. Oh, code signing. I can tell you're not mostly iOS developers, because usually at that point, everybody laughs, because code signing will kill you. But it's gotten better. But it's, it's just it's very hard <laughs> to get your stuff to run on a device. Now, I'm not trying to overstate this too much. I'm not saying that building really small, simple programs like I was building as a kid, is really hard in Swift. Or even putting it onto iOS. It's not actually that, it's not that hard. Some things are in fact much, much easier than it used to be. I mean, you definitely couldn't get your GPS location, you know, when I was doing stuff. And now that's actually pretty straightforward. Um, it's just, I'm not trying to say who has a harder time at this. I'm talking about the process, 
right? How do we actually learn things? And how does, how does our community expect us to learn things? It's about the importance of writing horrible code, right? I had been programming for about a decade before I encountered the concept of object-oriented programming. Before that, it was all what's called structured programming, just you know, subroutines, straight mutable state, you know, that's the, the whole thing. Um, I didn't seriously use objects for another decade. I'd been programming 20 years before I seriously, like, in anger, used an object. And that's when I went from Perl 4 to Perl 5, right? And Perl 5 had these new weird things called, you know, objects that you could bless. It's the weirdest syntax ever. Ble you blessed objects. I, I, I'm not kidding. Um, I had been programming for 25 years before I first encountered um, preemptive concurrency. Before that, I had actually worked on a phone switch. This is a DMS-10 uh, that Nortel built. That was one of my first jobs, um, first programming jobs. And um, it, could hand it did not have preemptive concurrency. It could handle 10,000 simultaneous connections on one 68030 processor, just like a, like a Mac processor, right? Um, and one thread. And you would be amazed at what you can build on just one giant wild true loop, right? And just a little bit of cooperation. It also had no dynamic memory allocation. So all of the cons, all, the, you could, all memory was allocated at boot and you could never allocate or destroy it. Well, that means there's no null pointers. It doesn't mean anything. All memory is there. It makes things so simple and really fast, actually. I've been programming for 30 years before I first heard the term functional programming. I now teach people functional programming, but I hadn't heard about it for 30 years, right? Let alone reactive programming and active and all these other things, right? Now, as I said, I'm older than some of you, I'm younger than some of you, but I'm still willing to bet that most of you, or at least many of you, have made it through your formative years of learning to code without ever running into a higher order function or a map or flat map or reduce or any of these things. And it's not that those things aren't important. It's not that they didn't exist. So functional programming goes back to the 50s. Lisp is as old as Fortran, right? ML, the, one of the biggest, uh, one of the main uh, functional languages that really brought things like type inference and all these, all these modern concepts. ML is uh, as old as C. Haskell is older than Java, right? These things were not new. They've been around. It's just actually nobody cared until pretty recently. I actually learned Lisp in college. Now, I told you I hadn't heard of functional programming. I did learn Lisp, a functional programming language. We weren't taught it as a functional programming language. We actually ignored that. Lisp, it's totally possible to do mutable state, and we did. You know, you just called set queue, and everything was mutable state, and it's fine. We had loops, we had the whole thing. What we were being taught by learning Lisp was that it was possible to run data, or that it was possible to have code and data be the same thing which is to say that Lisp is Perl. So we weren't taught lambda calculus or first class functions or any of that. I'm just, I'm not saying that these ideas aren't important. I'm just saying that they're advanced ideas. They're difficult ideas. And it took me years and actually decades to work up to them, right? Today, you can barely get started in the Swift community, right? Without some but helpful person coming along, it's often me, saying, oh, that, that for loop, that could be a flat map. Stop, just let me write the for loop, right? I understand it. Let's talk about being a newbie. So this was me, I, I had this project, um, and I chose to do the project in Python, uh, because we needed to work with the server, I wanted to work very closely with the server, and the server's all in Python. And uh, I had never in my life done serious work in Python. Um, I hadn't even looked, I'd looked at it briefly years before, but I, you know, I hadn't done anything serious with it. And I, I didn't know anything about, you know, virtual env or async IO or any of the more, you know, 
modern ideas or anything. I had never once created a thread with it. I had never created a coroutine or any of these things, but I, I had a new project. And um, I needed to do this server, this little server, but it needed to handle like thousands of client connections simultaneously and then talk to RabbitMQ. So it was like this AMQP system. And uh, I really wanted to get a prototype out of it in like a few days. Remember, I don't know Python, I don't know what I'm doing. So here I am, I'm a newbie with a deadline, the most dangerous kind of newbie, and I'm in way over my head. And um, now, I'm reminding you, I'm a very, very experienced programmer at this point, so what do I do? Well, of course, you all know, I pulled up you know, the tutorials and I worked through each concept carefully, step by step, until I fully understood it. And then, no, I didn't, I, I just started hacking. I just started searching the internet. I started like finding snippets of code and slapping them together and seeing what happened. And um, I skimmed through articles uh, and docs and kind of tried to find the, the thing that would fix my one little problem. I behaved exactly how newbies behave, right? Particularly a newbie in over your head with a deadline. And in a few hours, just a few hours, I had completely wrong, horribly designed, barely working piece of code. There's only one important word in that sentence. Working, I was bare, it barely, barely did what I wanted, but it did do what I wanted. And then I started rewriting it, right? And I learned just a little bit more. And every time I came across something that talked about generators or coroutines or list comprehensions, I, I just ignored it, right? Because too complicated, moving on. I mean, they're powerful. I'm not saying you shouldn't use them. You should, but they're complicated. So I just wanted to get it working. And then I discovered that I had a feature that I needed to build that I could not move forward on because I did build it really simply, which is to say I built it single-threaded, which means that um, it needed to handle thousands of connections, but it was blocking on one thread. It can only handle one connection at a time. So I was like, oh, I gotta do something. I, gotta, I, I need concurrency. So I went and found this old deprecated interface to thread and just said, Spawn a thread, added literally one line of code. Spawn a thread, done, ship it. <laughs> um, and kept going, and a week later it turned out, okay, that was actually a really, really foolish way to do it and that doesn't really work, because um, I'd blown thread safety, and so I started working on it some more. You know, I had been programming at this point 35 years, right? I have shipped code professionally in over half a dozen languages. I have worked on, on serious projects in over a dozen languages more, right? I have, I have studied a lot of languages. Um, and still, when I'm faced with a new language and a deadline, I kind of flail around, search the internet, and you know, slap it together and see what happens. Why, why, why would I do that? Because it's good. It's actually a good thing. Right? We pick on newbies for getting it over their heads, on picking projects that are too big for them. But big projects inspire you. That's why you're programming, right? Now for some people, I'm actually, I actually am kind of like, I, over the years, have gotten fascinated with programming literally for its own sake. But for most people, and rightfully so, they want the project. They just want the thing to work, to, to do the thing they want, and make the computer do something. And that's good. So we sit there and say, go back, go back, study. But it's okay, let them jump in. We should celebrate it. But, so in 35 years of becoming a newbie over and over again, I, I, I'm maybe actually a little bit better newbie than average. I, I've learned, I, I'd like to give a little bit of advice on how to write better software when you have no idea what you are doing. Let's talk about copying. We shame people all the time for copying off a of Stack Overflow, like it's a bad thing. I'm actually one of the top rated people in Stack Overflow. My, I, my rep is like over 200,000. Um, uh, I copy off a of Stack Overflow, right, <laughs> all the time. I, what do you think it's for? Why do you think we're allowed to write code on Stack Overflow if other people weren't supposed to copy it? Right? I actually copy stuff for Swift, a language I actually know quite well. There's nothing wrong with copying code, good things, or copying good things at least, that have been given freely, right? Shared with you. But I do actually copy a little bit differently than maybe a more beginner newbie. I don't cut and paste. 
almost never, almost never. Um, I usually actually retype the entire solution by hand. Um, particularly when it's only like, you know, a page of code, I just type it. Remember, my grandmother was a typing teacher, I type pretty fast. Um, but I actually don't type that fast. I think I try to understand each line. Like while I'm typing it, just, just the act of typing it forces you to look at it, right? And I try to understand, but sometimes it's too hard. I don't understand what it is. Well, okay, I just copy it verbatim. But other code, I sometimes try to fix it a little bit, make it more my style. So by the time I'm done, it's kind of my interpretation of the answer. I mean, it is copied. But it's not, it's not like a Xerox copy. It's like you're looking at a, at a painting and you're trying to like duplicate the painting, right? There's nothing wrong with that. And I rewrite all the time. I, I constantly am like refactoring and rewriting. My original Python script, I talk, I talk about, I like to refer to this thing as top-down development. If you've ever heard that concept of top-down. Top-down means you start at the top of the screen and you type until you get to the bottom. That's what that means. I just duplicated code like crazy, uh, all over the place. I ignored errors completely. I did not write unit tests. Uh, at the time, I did not know how to write unit tests. Um, I didn't know that actually for a really long time. Uh, and I just kind of beat on it until it worked. And as soon as it kind of worked, then I would start rewriting pieces to try to make it a little better, right? And then, for instance, why did I duplicate so much code? Because I literally did not know how to define a function in Python. And I wasn't going to bother learning. <laughs> I just couldn't paste code. But then I went and learned how you <laughs> define a function, moved it. And then I was like, oh, I wonder how you make a class. So I made a class that was one giant class that was the program and did everything. But OK, now I understand classes. So then I could break it up a little bit into other classes. And again, the system is very, very, very small, which is awesome. It's complicated, but it's, but it's contained. And it means that even though I don't know how to write tests, I I just kind of manually test it. It only needed to do a few things. So I could just check it out and keep making sure, OK, it seems to work, seems to work, keep going. And I still haven't cracked open any you know, learning Python book. So I wind up with these weird islands of knowledge where I know like, all this stuff about this thing, but don't know how to declare a function. You know? It's weird, but it's OK. It's OK. It's OK to be a newbie. It's OK to be lost. It, is, it means that you're learning. In fact, if you always feel like you're the expert, and you're probably in a rut, right? And maybe you should go do something else for a little while, right? It's not bad to be an expert, but maybe branch out. It's OK to flail. You know, just keep your things simple. Keep moving forward. And it all, until it doesn't. Uh, I mean. This, this, this whole story is a lie. I, I mean, it, it happened. It did happen. But it's how I told it at my first, the first time I told it at Yosemite. And then I went home and went back to working on it. The way I tell this story is very good. It's like, I want to get to this, this thing, and I'm going up the hill, and sometimes I have setbacks, and then I kind of work it out, and then I go up the hill, and I have little setbacks, but I'm always getting up to my, my goal. Sometimes it turns out that you're, on a you're actually walking up to a cliff with spikes at the bottom and the goal's over here. And that's what happened. I got back and I started to work on the project again and I realized that in fact it was completely wrong to be a production server. It, it, it rewrite it from scratch wrong. I mean like my whole, my whole approach made no sense because that's not how you write it in Python. Remember I said I ignored things like async IO and coroutines? Yeah, I need async IO and coroutines. Like, that's how you do it. And um, that little minor threading problem was not minor. Um, so yeah, OK. Sometimes you fail. And it's still OK. I, I had to start over. It happens. Some, sometimes you fail. But I still actually want to dig into that. Because some, some of you are actually kind of not along. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you pick yourself up. You keep going. It's good. You try again. I want to remind you that I play life on easy mode. right? And this is actually what I mean by I play life on easy mode. So I just actually put the project behind schedule by two weeks. right? Because I didn't know how to write this software. That I said, I can do it. So we're behind schedule now. And um, even that, but I, 
I wasn't afraid. I had no fear over that. I wasn't going to get fired over that. My boss didn't even fuss at me about that. He just said, yeah, eh, it happens, right? We'll move the schedule. We'll fix it. Let's go. That is what privilege actually means. That's what privilege is. It's not really often what you're given. It's what you're forgiven. Right? It's the fact that you get those second chances and third chances and fourth chances. And you don't even have to ask for them. They're just given. Right? And it's that feeling of safety that whatever happens, it'll all work out in the end. So when you're an expert, when you're the senior developer, when you have that safety, right? when you have a safety net that's there because of your status, you know, your senior developer, or maybe your background, your history, or it may just be because of what you look like, right, or where you were born, then it's your job to make room for those who don't, to make room on the net. You need to share your net. When you're an expert, it's very easy to forget this kind of twisty, weird path that got you there, right? It's easy to forget what it's like to not know things. And even more than that, how not to even know how you would know things. Like, how would I even learn? There was a time you didn't know. And it's really sometimes hard to remember that. Right? When you've immersed yourself for a long time in some ecosystem, its ways become your ways. And they become intuitive. Right? But they're not intuitive. That's not, it's not really true. It's just you're used to them. That's why I, usually, I, I used to say that things were, this is, this is easy, and I've learned to stop saying that. It's not true. I don't know what's easy. I don't actually know what's readable, right? Like, do it this way because it's more readable code. I, I don't know if it's more readable, it's more readable to me, but that, doesn't, that may not be more readable to you. What I do know from experience, because I've done it more than you have, from speaking to someone more junior, is I know what will scale. I know what's more powerful, what, can, what I can actually compose more easily, right? I know how this is going to turn out if you write it this way versus this way, right? And so I do know something about what it is worth for you to learn, but I can't tell you whether it's going to be easy for you to learn it. Only you will know. So a few years ago, I started playing guitar. And I'm still pretty bad at it. Um, my big hope someday is to be a mediocre guitarist. You know, just good enough so that um, if you're playing guitar on the back deck, then you know, people, most of the people might stay and not leave. I don't know. I'm not there yet, but you know, it's my dream. And I started hanging out with this group of guitarists at home. Um, for about three hours a week on Wednesdays, we play these three chord songs um, until my hands are ready to fall off. And a lot of times I can't keep up, and I just start playing the high strings. And sometimes, you know, I just just sit there and pretend to play. And um, but a few times they've even like tried to talk. They talked me into play, you know, leading a song for the whole group. And uh, I usually embarrass myself when I do that. But they're incredibly welcoming, right? They're incredibly supportive. These are some of these folks are really, really good musicians. I mean, you do, sometimes we just stop and let one of them play, and it's fantastic. But they let me play along with them, like I'm part of the group, and I am. They make me part of the group. In the iOS world, there is this very strange phenomenon called James Dempsey and the Breakpoints. Break James Dempsey is an old Apple engineer who started writing songs about Apple technologies when he worked at Apple, and he would sing them at our largest conference called WWDC, the Worldwide Developers Conference. Uh, he would sing them like at the end of sessions. <laughs> and this kind of spun up over the years until he kind of put together this, uh, this uh, touring band. Touring is, is over saying it. At some conferences, if there, are, if there is James Dempsey and multiple people of his, quote, band, who are called the Breakpoints, who is whoever happens to be in town, there's a jam. Um, and my dream was to actually play with the breakpoints. I was like, I want to play. I mean, we're talking about playing before rooms of, you know, dozens of people. <laughs> but I wanted to play with the breakpoints, and um, it was going to be the first time I was playing in public. And he said, yes. I went and asked. I said, 
can I play with you guys? And he said, yes. And I immediately panicked on the inside because I was not ready. And I asked him, I said, okay, okay, uh, can you send me the whole set list and I will practice everything and I will just practice and practice. And he said, sure, he, he'd send them. And he did, he sent, he sent them all. But then he said, you know, it's okay, it's fine if you just play some of the songs. Or if there are parts like bridge, uh, bridges are often a little harder to play, it's like, if you drop out, that's okay. You can still play with us. You don't have to learn all of them. And um, he says it's better to have a few songs that, are really, that you're really good at than to kind of like flub your way through, you know, all of them. And I said, oh, yeah, 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 of course, of course, of course, I know that. I, I'm, I'm cool. I did not know that. I was, my plan was to practice them all and then beat myself up nonstop over the fact that I couldn't play them because I'm not a very good guitarist. I needed someone who knows more than me to give me permission to be a beginner. I need him to say it out loud, but still let me play. I'm still a liar. So I've given this talk a few times, and I've always used this line, I'm a bad guitarist, but someday I hope to be a mediocre guitarist. And I love the line, it's a really great line. Um, but I finally realized it's not true. I am a mediocre guitarist. <laughs> and I know, it's a little funny. It's, it's funny, but it's actually important. It's important to acknowledge that I've improved as a guitarist, right? There was a time I was a bad guitarist, and now I am a mediocre guitarist, right? It matters. It's really weird for me to say, I would stand, you know, for me to stand up and say, hey, I'm a really bad guitarist, come watch us play tonight, right? It's actually kind of insulting to James Dempsey that he would let me play with him if I'm such a bad guitarist, right? It's important to be honest about your own skills, that, that doesn't mean beat yourself up, it means actually be honest. He even invited me to play, this is a big benefit concert that happens at WWDC, the big giant Apple Delt concert, right? He let me play on the big stage. People pay money to come in here, right? And I'm still pretty inexperienced at this time, but it's a big crowd, and I can play along. And in fact, the show is better with me than without me. You would never come to watch me play, but you would, but it is a better show with me. I told, I told all that to James, and he actually pointed out to me, he's like, we focus so much on everyone striving for excellence in everything, and we forget that most of the time, what we need from most people is competence. And I think that that's the important thing, to understand what it means to just be competent. We don't mean that in an insulting way. We mean literally just being able to, in, a, in the guitar world, to play a handful of chords competently, right? That is a skill, and that you can get it up, up to that. In the same way with programming, that we think so much about this excellence, but we actually just need people, in most of the people, to be able to fix bugs, right? Competently, and ship them on time. That's most of what we need. It's easy to fall into kind of self-deprecation, uh, but it actually becomes harmful. I found that all of these music groups, they're so welcoming. The culture really pushes you to grow and improve yourself. And that's what I want to bring from that community to our community. I want to be welcoming, right? I want us to stop shaming people for learning and for struggling. Right? I want us to stop trying to define what a real developers do. Right? If you can make a computer do what you wanted it to do, at least most of the time, you are a real developer. I saw this talk explaining that in order to be a real developer, you need to be able to build things without frameworks. Right? You just, if you needed anything more than jQuery, you're not a real developer. And of course, you know, that's ridiculous. As all of us iOS developers know, real developers don't use JavaScript. And you'll actually hear that from, from iOS developers quite a lot. I mean, my high-level abstractions are just tools that let me rise above all the meaningless details and focus on deeper problems. Your you know, high-level abstractions, they're a crutch. I'm a real developer. Uh, that's actually 
that shouldn't be controversial. I mean, I, I've built, I build robotic systems. Uh, I've actually designed you know, layer one networking protocols. I have hand-wired RAM. Um, I've built kernel extensions. Uh, I literally wrote a book explaining all many of the internal workings of Objective-C, like how all the weird magic actually is implemented and works. I, I am a real developer. I don't feel any shame saying that. That said, um, know what I've never done? Ever seen iOS apps, I think Android apps have it too, where you can pull down and you get that little spinner at the top to say, is this called pull to refresh in the iOS world? I don't know how to do that. I actually don't know what the pieces are. I, I've never done it, it's never come up. Um, I have never put an app on the App Store. I don't know the process. I've always tricked somebody else into doing it for me. I, I don't know how it works. Um, until about a year ago, I did not know how hash tables worked. Right? Um, and I actually looked it up because I was saying I didn't know how hash tables work, and then I was like really fascinated with how hash tables work, so I looked it up. That's the only reason. <laughs> right? um, I have never once in my whole career passed a whiteboard interview. Right? I have taught, I am actually, I'm very, very good at like take home problems where you ask me to like work on something on my own. Um, but uh, I have taught week long courses in iOS development. I mean, I teach other developers, but if you came to me and said, write FizzBuzz, I, I, I will fail. I promise you, I, fa I will fail on the first three attempts. Because I have. There is this kind of foundations argument, right? That you need to know the foundations of your craft. And this is not to put too fine a point on it, malarkey. Um, I assure you that no one knows the foundations of their craft. Carl Sagan has this wonderful saying, um, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, first you must create the universe. So iOS developers will often laugh at people, at anyone who would say that jQuery is the lowest level you need to learn, right? But what should it be? I mean, is C low enough? If you know C, are you a real developer? Logic gates. DOM manip manipulation, type theory, uh, doping silicon to make semiconductors. Actually, I've done that too. The church Turing thesis, writing an optimizing compiler, manual retain counting, building Babbage's analytical engine, uh, working in abacus. I mean, what is this one foundational level that then, finally, finally, you're a real developer? I used to be a sysadmin for uh, many years, and I, I worked in a big enterprise, doing big enterprise-y stuff. This is back in the 90s before, you know, containerization. I mean, we had like real hardware, and you know, you said, that's my server, it's right there. You could kick it. And I had this question I would ask people when I was interviewing them. I would say, how many computers do you own? How many of them work? And how many have a case on them? And uh, at the time, my answer was five, three, and one. <laughs> and I thought those were actually pretty good answers. Those were the kind of answers I hoped people would give me. And there's a lot kind of wrapped up in that question. And, and that was my intent. I wanted there to be a lot wrapped up in the question. At the time, I really thought it was a very, very clever question in really capturing a lot in a very, very short space. I, what I said I wanted was I, was I was looking for people who loved computers as much as I did, right? I wanted people who ran obscure operating systems and would buy weird hardware to run them on. You know, people who tinker. And of course, we had a good reason for that. There was a reason I was asking these. It's because we had a very complicated environment filled with all kinds of operating systems. I mean, we had SunOS and Solaris and HBUX and IRIX and some custom things. We had all kinds of stuff. And we needed people who could pick up bizarre, unfamiliar technologies really easily. But that was nonsense. That was actually nonsense. Because I mean, we did have a complicated environment. I'm not saying it, it was complicated. And we did need people who could, under, who could learn it. But you know what we needed more? We need people who could reliably work trouble tickets and close them, right, with good user support. We desperately needed people who could take a customer, take a relationship with, with some client group and de-escalate it. When, when the sysadmin team and the, and the client team were get, was rising up, we needed people who could calm that down because that was a skill we lacked. I lacked that. I was not good. I, I would tend to ramp it up. So those were the skills we really needed. 
And here I am asking about questions. I mean, asking about computers. What I was really asking, I wasn't asking about computers. I'm asking, are you like me? I'm asking, do you have the kind of free time it takes, right, to play around with computers? Do you have my hobbies? Do you have some spare cash to go buy old equipment and, and hack it together? Do you have as few responsibilities at home as, as I do, you know, as a single guy living in, in my own apartment, right? But still, at this time, I really, I really believe that to be skilled, truly skilled at your job, you had to have a deep love of the field. Like I said, I fell in love with computers when I was eight years old. And since then, I have always known what I would do with my life. And I have never regretted it. Uh, I love computers as much today as I did when I was eight years old. So I had this crazy house. This contractor built it for himself, and he kind of did a lot of odd jobs around it that he wasn't really qualified to do. Um, he did all the plumbing and the electrical and all that stuff, and he was not a plumber or electrician. Um, and so it's a weird house. And that means I have to have a lot of professionals come in and fix things all the time. Um, and I have this plumber. I have this plumber I use repeatedly. I like him a lot. Um, he's a really good plumber, really good plumber. Um, he mostly does like remodels and retrofits and weird problems like, like my house. Um, you know, anything that has these weird constraints, I want to put like this toilet in the basement, so you have to have like pumps. It's, it's all very weird and like have to, he had to go research stuff for it. So anytime somebody tells you that computer, that software is special because no two projects are the same, yeah, everybody has that. It's not special. Another talk, I gotta have a whole talk on that. Plumber, 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 great plumber, love this plumber. He hates plumbing, hates it, right? It makes his knees hurt, it makes his back hurt. He wants to retire as soon as he can and get out of it. He absolutely does not plumb in his spare time, right? And of course, he's always asked, you know, when, he, when he's home for the holidays or something, his family always wants him to fix plumbing things, just like computer people. Everybody has it. He got into plumbing because it's good money. He got into plumbing because his uncle was a plumber, right? So he took classes, he learned, learned plumbing, he got his license, and he's been a plumber for like 40 years now. But he hates it. Is he a real plumber? Of course, he's a real plumber. I mean, he's a professional licensed plumber, right? <laughs> of course he is. What would, what would it mean, a real plumber? Why would you even ask that? So why do we talk about real developers, right? Whether they love it or they're just here for the money. This was actually, I was, personally, I am here for love. It turns out, when I talk about I got lucky, I was incredibly lucky that it turned out that my hobby pays well. Because I would have done it anyway. Don't tell my boss. Right? But that meant that for many, many years, I actually was quite resentful of people who are just here for the money. Right? Didn't care. But I actually found a funny thing about that. I found a lot of those people who were just here for the money, um, they were actually better at shipping product. Right? You see, deep down, I'm an amateur programmer. I do it for love. That's what amateur means. Right? I was filtering out professional developers, people who do this as their profession. Right? So which one of those is the real developer? It's easy to forget that playing with computers is not the same thing as shipping quality software on time. Right? The most important skills of a senior developer are in order debugging, ske project scheduling, debugging, and debugging. Right? Also, writing code that is easier to debug, uh, creating logging systems so you can debug things in the field, performance tuning, and debugging. We have these whiteboard interviews, right? And we test your knowledge of these very specific algorithms and data structures, right? Most of which almost never come up in actual development, right? And some folks have suggested to me that, they, that it's very important to understand big O complexity analysis 
because of your code, so that you can optimize for performance. They need, they need the speed. I'm gonna call shenanigans. I, I happen to be a professional in this space. I actually do quite a lot of performance tuning um, on a lot of platforms. I have done it for many, many years, and here is what I have found. Number one, cause of real world performance problems, in my experience, is that you're doing something don't need doing. Like, just stop. Don't do it, right? People, I've watched people spend days messing around with trying to create some hash function so that it can convert this vector into a hash map, right? Because they, they need a specialized hash function to pull that off. And, um, and they finally get like a 10% performance boost. And in the performance world, 10% is actually quite a lot. That's a, that's a pretty good improvement. And then I come into the code, and I see the logging line that's serializing everything to JSON, right? Let's take that out, and we improve 2,000% improvement, right? Just stop. You didn't need it, right? The most dangerous kind of per developer for performance of a system is one who deeply knows big O analysis, but does not know how to profile a program, profile first. And yet, we quiz people on algorithms. Number two cause of real world performance problems is allocating or deallocating memory or in areas that have reference counting, reference counting or allowing garbage collection, anything involving memory. For all love of all that is holy, please do not mess with memory in the middle of performance code because it's horrible. It will, it will trash your performance, right? You never, never, never want that to be in like your tight loop. You never want memory to come and go, right? The thing is, complexity analysis, big O notation, right? It has a, it has a baked in assumption. The assumption is that, 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 that N, you know, O of N. The assumption is that N is so large that it is enormous and so enormous that every other concern is irrelevant, right? It doesn't matter in, big, in complexity analysis. It does not matter how long each step takes. So if I tell you that you can have an ON algorithm and each end, um, it can do up to a billion uh, entries in a second, or I tell you you have an O1 algorithm, but it takes a day, but it's a day for any amount, for any number of elements. You know, which one do you want? Complexity analysis says you should take the, well, the O1. O1's always better. It's like, no, it isn't. It is a very dangerous assumption to smuggle in this idea that N is so enormous when every N in your system ever, I assure you, is much, much, much smaller than infinity. At least pretty small. I mean, smaller than it is. A little, I don't know. It's math. Cannot, don't argue with the math. And yet, we, we quiz people on complexity analysis. We should actually be focusing on things like memory churn, right? That's actually something that causes a problem like locality, memory locality. Seriously, like having all of the things you want to talk to being in the same location of memory rather than having a spread over memory, that has serious real world implications. It's actually a fairly common uh, performance bottleneck because you just can't get, the, you can't get the memory all into the same place at the same time. It's actually more likely to hit you than uh, complexity. And yet we don't quiz people on that. Not at all. Why, 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 why don't we do that? Because undergraduate CS degrees teach runtime complexity. That's what they teach, right? They don't teach CPU architecture, they, right? They don't, speak, they don't talk about cache lines. Cache lines are actually very, very important. But we don't talk about them in undergraduate CS courses except maybe like that one course you had on computer architecture, right? We're not really checking your analysis skills. What we're, see, we're not seeing how, how do you think. I love when they say, I just want to see how you think. I usually think in the shower. HR never lets us finish the interview. No, we're checking something else. We're checking that you learn the things that we had to learn. It's hazing. If a data structure quiz selected me, a data structure quiz must be a pretty good way to select people. If my whole pledge class had to run across the quad in our underwear, clearly that demonstrates character or something, right? And it's time, I want to stop the hazing. Right? It's not good enough to ask, 
could this interview question be useful? That's not good enough. You need to ask, why am I asking this one, as opposed to all the other questions I could be asking that actually have something to do with what I care about. And if you don't, if you just ask questions that boil down to, are you like me? Are your skill sets the same skill sets I have? Then you're not allowed to be surprised when you look around your, uh, your team and you go, you all, they all look the same. And they all have the same strengths. And they all have the same weaknesses which is the worst possible thing you could do for your team. We don't have a licensing board. We don't have anything, uh, there's no kind of recognized you know, certification. So I'm gonna make a new rule, new rule that says when you're a real programmer, uh, real programmers have written the program Hello World in some language. And um, if you haven't, you are not, not a real programmer. Now, tell you what, tell you what, I, I'm not good at live coding, I told you that, but I am actually a pretty good teacher, so if you haven't, you know, see me, we'll, I'll get you your certification, we'll get you through Hello World, right? In some, pick your language, right? That's the bar, that's what it takes. Now, every time, the first times I gave this talk, I would stop there, and I'd actually go off on this riff. Um, and the riff goes like this. I, I've raised actually a bunch of hard questions there, especially that last little bit. I, but people should immediately start asking. It's like, well, Rob, you just said all these things. I'm not allowed to ask these things, but aren't these legitimate questions? I mean, to ask of real developers? Um, and what I would do is I would say, yeah, I'm new at this. I'd ask for your forgiveness, and then that'd be the end of the talk. And of course, you give it, and we all we all hug and, you know, in an appropriate way, and that would be it. It's very very meta. Anyway, but the more I thought about it, it's like I this is like the fifth time I've given this talk, right? That's me abusing my safety net. I don't get to keep saying I don't know how to give a talk, right? I don't get to say I've thought about this for years and I still don't have any answers at all, right? And I don't get to ask you for forgiveness when I haven't done my best, and then just assume you'll give it to me. That's not fair. At some point, I have to take responsibility, right? The basic point, though, of these questions is that the idea that a safety net means that there's some lack of responsibility, right? That, there are, that suddenly I can't, I can't have any opinions on it. There's no responsibility for the, for the developer. There's no accountability. That's usually what people are afraid of. It's like, well, where's accountability? And I'm not telling you there's no accountability. What I'm telling you is stop that the focus is on trust first, trust and community, and being able to be vulnerable, and allowing other people to be vulnerable. When you're in a community where it's okay to make mistakes, right, without being cast out, that's where you can do your best work. And it's up to the, kind of the old timers, it's up to the people who consider themselves gatekeepers, right, to make the room for the newbies. It is up to them to shut down the other old timers who are trying to get in the way of that. And allow them to allow newcomers and old timers to make mistakes and still grow. It doesn't mean we don't acknowledge our mistakes. It doesn't mean we just ignore them. It means that we allow them and acknowledge them. It's our job to teach, not chastise, right? Every generation has to grow and mentor your replacements. If you're only, for instance, if your company only hires senior, experienced, low-risk developers, where do you think the next generation of senior, low-risk developers comes from? Right? They don't just appear. Right? If we want our industry to thrive long enough for us to retire at least, right? We, most of us have a few years left. Then we're going to have to keep tending that. We're going to have to keep replenishing the well. Right? We have to tend to our community, our industry, and we have to welcome people who want to join and help them grow. And that also means, by the way, hire them. So when we think about these questions that I raised, it's, these questions really all boil down to this question, yes, 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 I know, but when do I get to judge them? And what I'm saying is it's the wrong question. There are questions you should ask. They're different, right? How, they're about how do I teach, not how do I judge. How do I help, rather than how do I kick out the ones who I think are no good? I'm not saying not to have judgment. You need to be, it is actually important to be able to distinguish good and bad code. It is worthy to say that code is not going to work very well, right? That is part of the job. 
But it's not your job to judge the, your coworkers. It's your job to help them grow and to meet them where they are. So kids today, right? I think they're pretty awesome. Thanks.